So brothers and sisters, please open up your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Now, as I said, Andrew and I became parents about seven months ago. And whilst I was in Toronto, Canada, I gave a sermon over there about how watching my wife go through labor and pregnancy taught me an awful lot about what the Bible says about the last days and how the Bible compares the last days to labor pains and things like this. Seeing my wife go through labor and childbirth really illuminates a lot about what the Bible says about this. Now, of course, over the last seven months, it's not the, uh, the birth anymore. It's now watching my wife feed our daughter and keep her alive, essentially. And now that Miriam's seven months old, we've obviously moved her on to something a bit different. She now has what you call solid food because milk is no longer enough. So we've moved her on to something a bit different. And that's what the writer of Hebrews kind of addresses here in chapter 5. So it's chapter 5 from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. But though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Now the word oracles there in the Greek is logion, so it's like logos, the word. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So what this is saying is, is that, as we all know, babies have milk. When you have a two-week-old baby, milk is the only thing that baby can handle. Babies will have milk. You wouldn't, you wouldn't feed a two-week-old baby steak and chips, would you? That wouldn't really go well, would it? You have milk as a baby. As a two-week-old baby, you have milk. That is what the Lord has provided. And I'll tell you, breast milk is actually one of the biggest proofs of the existence of God. There's so much I know about breast milk now than I did this time a year ago. So breast milk is fascinating the way it works. It really is an evidence of design. Now, of course, like I said, babies have milk when they're a baby. But then a baby will eventually reach a time where they need something more than milk or in addition to milk. And they will need something a bit more sturdy, something which will sustain them a bit more because they're growing. So they move on to solid food. And that's what we're doing now with Miriam. She's now having pureed vegetables, things like this. We actually tried some scrambled egg with her this morning as well, and that went down okay. However, solid food is now more appropriate, but obviously the milk still continues as well. This is how it works, doesn't it? It's called weaning, isn't it? We gradually give her more and more solid food, pureed vegetables and fruit, this kind of thing, because that's what she now needs. Now, the Word of God is often likened to food, isn't it? We often see various foods in the Bible which are types and pictures of the Word of God. For example, in Jeremiah 15, verse 16, your words were found and I ate them. It talks about eating the Word of God like food. In, G in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 4, verse 4, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we often see in the Bible that the Word of God is often likened to food. And this is something as well that we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, which says, As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. So pure milk in the Bible represents what you'd call basic doctrine, the basic stuff, the foundational stuff. The Bible calls this milk. That's why Peter, writing to people who he calls babies in 1 Peter 2, 2, says, Desire the pure milk of the word of God. This is something that babies would have. They would have milk, and milk, of course, in the Bible, is like the basic stuff that a new believer would have. You'd have the basics, the foundational stuff. But then solid food, which a baby eventually moves on to, solid food would be the, the more advanced doctrines, the more complicated things, the things that you have to study a bit more in depth. This is what the Bible would call solid food. And this is something Paul addresses as well, with the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 1, he says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babes in Christ. So the Corinthians here were babes in Christ. They were new believers. They were baby Christians. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? 
So he's saying the Corinthians were baby Christians. They were still behaving like baby Christians. And this is why Paul couldn't feed them solid food because they wouldn't be able to handle it. He had to still feed them milk. So in exactly the same way as you'd never feed a two-week-old baby steak and chips, you also wouldn't teach a new believer, a believer who's been saved for a month or two, you wouldn't teach them about the rapture or replacement theology or end times or Jewish typology or things like this. You wouldn't teach this to a new believer. What does a new believer need? A new believer needs the milk. A new believer needs to hear about salvation and repentance and redemption and atonement and God's grace and this kind of thing. This is what a new believer needs to hear. They don't go on to the more complicated stuff until they're more mature, just like a baby won't go on to solid food until they've matured a bit. It's exactly the same. It's like when kids start in primary school. It's about four or five years old, isn't it? They start in primary school, and when they have maths lessons, they wouldn't start learning calculus and algebra and trigonometry and ge geometry and things like this. They start to learn how to count and how to add up. They learn the basics, don't they? You're not going to teach a four-year-old algebra. You'll teach a four-year-old how to add up and how to count. You don't go on to the advanced stuff until they're mature enough. Now, of course, like I said, new believers need to hear the basics. They need to be fed the milk. This is one of the mistakes I made when I first got saved 16 years ago. When I first got saved, I got straight away obsessed with the complicated stuff. I got straight into the end times, the antichrist, the rapture, the mark of the beast, things like this. I spent hours on YouTube watching clip after clip about all this end time stuff. When what I should have been doing was getting the milk, the pure milk of the word of God. This is what I should have been doing as a young believer, as a new believer. But I got straight away into the stuff that I couldn't yet handle. I, I loved learning about the last days and the rapture and the antichrist and this kind of stuff. But what I needed was the foundational basics, what the Bible calls the pure milk of the word of God. But of course, the time comes in a believer's life where milk is no longer enough. When you've been saved for a couple of years, the milk is no longer enough. You need to then move on to something a bit different. You need to move on to something more substantial, something which is going to nourish you. And that would be the more complicated stuff, the complicated doctrines of the Bible. And the problem that we have today in the church is the same problem that the writer of Hebrews addresses right here in chapter 5, is that we still have Christians of 10, 20, 30, even 40 years who are still on milk. They are still taking milk, and that's all they're having. They haven't moved on to solid food yet. They've been saved many years, and they're still on the same stuff that a baby is. They're still learning the same things that a Christian who's been saved for a month is learning. That's a big problem that we have in the church today, is that Christians are not moving on to the milk. Do you know how many Christians there are? This might even be yourself. Do you know how many Christians there are who have been saved for 10, 20, 30 years and still have not even touched large chunks of the Bible. They still haven't even touched massive portions of the Bible in their 10, 20, 30 year walk with the Lord. Why? Because they're still on milk. They're still on milk and they haven't moved on to something more substantial yet. And this again is a big problem in the church. The same problem that the writer of Hebrews addresses right here. So when a baby acts like a baby, it's always cute, isn't it? Miriam makes all these funny noises. She always goes, ba 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 da da things like this. And people go, oh, she's so cute, isn't she? Oh, isn't she adorable? What if she's still doing that when she's 30? <laughs> it's not so cute anymore at 30, is it? Why? Because you don't expect that behavior from a 30-year-old. You expect it from a baby. You expect a baby to behave like a baby, but then when that baby becomes a 30-year-old man or woman, you don't expect the same behavior anymore. And that's why there are still Christians of 10, 20 plus years who are still behaving like babies because they're still on the milk. They haven't moved on to solid food yet. A massive problem. Now, of course, this is obviously is the responsibility of every believer. Every believer is responsible for their own personal Bible study. They're responsible to move on to more solid food. But it is also the responsibility of the church. The church is also responsible for feeding you a healthy combination of milk and solid food. Now, if you go to any church these days, most of the time, if you get milk, that's actually a result. Because these days, churches aren't even serving milk. They're serving what the Bible calls chaff. Chaff. Chaff is basically worthless. The book of Amos addresses this in chapter 8. Chaff. Chaff has no nutritional value. It has no nutritional value whatsoever. That's why it says that the chaff will be thrown into the fire. 
That's what churches are serving these days. They're serving chaff. If you get milk in a church these days, that's a result. They're serving chaff, which is feeding no one. So the people who are in church, either on milk after many years or on chaff, they're basically not being nourished. They're dying of spiritual starvation, literally. They are, they are being starved spiritually. If someone isn't getting the nutrition they need, their body begins to starve and to go into starvation mode. And that is the case with so many Christians today in these modern churches. They are not getting fed. They are getting fed milk at best. They're not even getting the milk these days. They're getting chaff instead. Again, a massive problem. Now, this is something we see a lot, particularly in America, because in America, you have something which is known as the seeker-friendly gospel. Does everyone know what the seeker-friendly gospel is? What they do is in America, I'm not making this up, in America, you get these pastors and elders who go around knocking on people's doors, and they'll, they'll knock and they'll say, hey, I'm Pastor James from your local Baptist church. I won't do the accent for the whole thing. <laughs> and they'll say, do you, do you come to church? And their guy will say, well, I used to come many years ago to church, but, you know, I stopped going because I simply didn't like it. I didn't like church. And they'll say, okay, what would you like to have in your local church that will make you want to come? They're literally going around doing market research, finding out what people want in order to get them to come to church. So if they say, we want to hear this, we want to see that, they'll do it just to get them to come to church. This is called the seeker-friendly gospel. We're seeing it quite a lot, particularly in America. Now, imagine if you did that with kids. I mentioned about kids going to school and getting the lessons that they need. What do you say to children? What would you like to see in your school to make you like it? Oh, yeah, I don't like school. I've never liked school. Okay, what would you like to see in your school that would make you like it? Well, they're not going to say, yeah, we want more ma ma mathematics and more English literature. My wife's an English teacher. What a boring subject it is. No one wants to actually go to school and learn English literature. Shakespeare's going to be held quite accountable for boring many children, isn't he? Children don't want this stuff, do they? That's why they don't like school. They're not going to say, yeah, we want to hear more physics, more mathematics, more English literature. They're going to say, yeah, we want, we want Xbox, we want video games, we want filthy movies, we want South Park and things like this. That's what they're going to say they want, aren't they? They're not going to say they want what they need. This is the seeker-friendly gospel. If you had a nutritionist who was assigned to a professional athlete, professional athletes obviously have personal nutritionists, who will prepare for them the exact meals they need, not the meals they want, but the meals they need, and the exact amount of protein and carbs and, and things like this, nutritionists know what they're doing. They wouldn't say to a professional athlete, well, what would you like to eat today? You have the choice. Oh, that's lovely. Well, if I've got the choice, well, I'll start with a full English maybe, you know, with some, some um, fried bread and things like this. Maybe for lunch, I'll go on to some cheeseburger and, and fries, you know. And then for dinner, maybe an extra large meat feast with a stuffed crust. And, and then I'll cap it off with some nice Ben and Jerry's cookie dough. You know, that's what someone would say. That's what I would say if I, if I was given the choice of what I wanted to have. What a nutritionist does for an athlete is they will give them what they need, not what they want. You'd never say to an athlete, what would you like to have to eat today? You give them what they need, not what they want. Now, the thing is, it's the same with the Bible. No one likes eating vegetables. No one likes eating some of this stuff that's good for you, do they? But the thing is, it is good for you for a reason. And it's the same with the Bible. There are some things in the Bible that are difficult to stomach. Everyone reads the Bible and then at some point comes across something which is difficult to digest. Just like a baby finds it difficult to digest solid food. And that is what we see in John chapter 6. When Jesus was teaching about you know, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, Many people said these are hard things to understand and many people left him and deserted him and he was left with only the 12 disciples, John chapter 6. Well, that's what the Bible's like. The Bible contains some things which are not easy to grasp and not easy to digest, but it's what we need. It's not something that God has just said, here you go, you can have it if you want or you can just pick some parts of it if you like it. If you don't like it, that's fine. No, the Lord says this is the, this is the meal you need just like a nutritionist would say to a professional athlete, this is what you need, God has provided us what we need in his word. And we need to move on to something more substantial than the milk. We need solid food, which is in the Bible. It's the same that kids don't like doing mathematics and physics and stuff like this. They just want to be having fun. But what they need are the lessons that are going to stand them in good stead for the future. Again, you don't give children what they want, you give them what they need. Now, what else do babies do? 
Babies go after things that they shouldn't go after. If you leave things laying around and the baby swallows it, then it's going to kill them. If you leave a bottle of bleach laying around, a baby is going to think, oh, what's this? I wonder what this tastes like. And the baby is going to drink it and probably die. You, leave, you, don't, you don't leave things laying around for a baby to get, do you? Parents must protect their children by putting these things out of reach. So what else do we do with baby Christians? With baby Christians, we protect them by move, removing the things that are also going to kill them. False doctrine. Deceived by these false doctrines. Young believers are easily deceived by false doctrines. And it's the responsibility of the older believers to protect them, just like a parent's responsibility is to protect their child. So that is why, here at CFM Essex, you are going to hear us name and shame false teachers. And one of the things you'll hear from today's liberal, lukewarm churches, oh no, you shouldn't be naming and shaming false teachers. That's unloving, that's unhelpful, that's divisive. You're being divisive. No. Let's see what the Word of God says about this. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul is talking to Timothy, a young believer, an experienced, mature believer, talking to a young believer. And he says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 16, Shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth saying that the resurrection is past and they overthrow the faith of some. So hang on, I thought we were supposed to be, you know, loving and not divisive and things like this. Well, Paul here is naming two false teachers for Timothy to be aware of. Let's move on to 2 Timothy 4 in verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Paul here is warning Timothy about a false teacher Alexander the coppersmith. He had no problem naming and shaming someone who's going to do him damage. That's why, again, we are going to tell you, stay away from this teacher. Stay away from him. Stay away from her. They're a deceiver. They're a liar. This is why we do this. Not to be unloving or divisive. Not to be unhelpful. But to protect the young believers from swallowing things that are going to kill them. Third John. In John's third epistle, he's writing to this guy called Gaius in Ephesus. 3 John from verse 9, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. He's warning Gaius here about Diotrephes. Paul and John had no problem naming and shaming dangerous people. And we should be doing the same, brothers and sisters. When liberal, liberal, lukewarm believers tell you you shouldn't be you know, divisive and unhelpful and name false teachers, that is a lie because these saints had no problem naming and shaming false teachers. We don't do it to be unloving. We don't do it to be unhelpful. We do it because we are protecting young believers from these, from these walls. And any pastor who refuses to do that is not doing their job. Any pastor who says... It's not right to call out false teachers. They are not doing their job. Why? What is the word for pastor in Hebrew and Greek? It means shepherd. In Hebrew, it's roe, and in Greek, it's poimen. The word for pastor in both languages means shepherd. What is a shepherd's job? A shepherd's job is to protect the sheep. That is what a shepherd does. That's why the shepherd has what? A rod, a rod and staff. You're a rod and staff, they comfort me. What does a shepherd do with a rod? He beats off wild animals. The shepherd protects the sheep from wild animals. What are wild animals in the Bible? Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That is what wolves are, false teachers. False teachers are wolves. And what do you do as a good shepherd, as a good pastor? You protect the young sheep from the wolves. That is what a good shepherd does, and that is what a good pastor does. How do you protect the young sheep from the wolves, you point them out. You say, he's a false teacher. He is dece he's a deceiver. And you do this out of love for the person, not for the teacher, but for the person, the young believer. It is an act of love, isn't it? It's our responsibility to do this for young believers. Now, if I found a bottle of bleach and I go ahead and drink it and I die, who's responsible for my death? I am. I'm the one responsible for doing that stupid act. If a 
six-month-old baby picks up a bottle of bleach and puts it in his mouth and dies, who's responsible for the child's death? The parent. It's the parent who's responsible, isn't it? Why? Because the child is not accountable yet. That's exactly how it works in the church, brothers and sisters. We are accountable and responsible for the young believers from being deceived by this nonsense. That is why you will hear us call out false teachers. You will hear us tell you that Joel Osteen is a false teacher and that you should avoid him. You will hear us tell you that Kenneth Copeland is a deceiver and that you should stay away from him. We're not saying that to be unloving or divisive or unhelpful. We're saying it to protect the young believers, just like a good shepherd would do. Now, when I first got saved, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a false teacher. I didn't even know that false teachers was even a thing until I started reading the Bible for myself and then seeing what some of these wolves were saying. As I said, I got into all this stuff. I didn't know where these videos were coming from or what ministries they were coming from. I just loved listening about the last days. What I did after that is I went back to the basics. I went back to the foundational truth, the milk of the word of God, which is what every new believer needs. This is what I did. I went back to the basics. Then when it came time for me to move on to solid food, that is when I did. That is when I got back into the advanced doctrines of the Bible because it was the right time. And that is what we seek to do here at CFM Essex. We seek to serve a healthy combination of milk and solid food because an adult doesn't just stop having milk. An adult moves on to solid food, but milk is still an important part of our diet, isn't it? Any doctor or nutritionist will tell you that. That is why we still have the milk as well. We still need to be taught the basics. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved for, the basics are still important, but they're not enough. You need to move on to something more substantial and something more advanced. That is how it works. Now, the Bible says that we are fighting a war and we are running a race. We are fighting a war. That's why it says in Ephesians 6 to put on the full armor of God. And we are running a race, according to Paul. So, in order to fight a war and to run a race, you need the right nutrition. If you just had milk, then you're not going to be able to sustain yourself, are you? I'm an, ex, I'm an ex-marathon runner. I'm ex-army. My fastest marathon time is under 3 hours 15. Did I achieve that by having milk? No. I achieved that by the right nutrition. A marathon runner needs porridge, carbs, vegetables, fruit, chicken, fish, eggs, this kind of stuff. This is what a marathon runner needs. If a marathon runner just had milk and that's all they had, they wouldn't last a mile. Their body would give up after a mile, wouldn't it? If a soldier went into battle and all they'd had is milk, then they're not going to last. They're going to faint. They're going to collapse. You need something more substantial. So in order to run this race, in order to fight this war, you need more than milk. You need the pure word of God and the advanced doctrines as well as the basics. And that is why, if you're a new believer, then you should be having milk, and you should stay on the milk for the time being. If you've been saved a couple of years, it's now time to move on to something better than milk. It's now time to move on to something more substantial, something more advanced. And if you've been saved 20, 30, 40 years, warn young believers about false teachers. It is a biblical commandment. We should be pointing out false teachers and warning young believers about the dangers of these teachers. But whether you're a baby, whether you're mature, or whether you're newly saved, or whether you've been a believer for 40 years, we should all be studying our Bibles regularly. We should all be picking up our Bibles. Our Bibles should not be collecting dust on the shelves like in some home, in some houses. We should be studying our Bibles regularly because don't forget, the Word of God is Jesus. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. When you reject the Bible, you reject Jesus Christ himself because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Give thanks in prayer very quickly. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this celebration. And we do thank you, Heavenly Father, for the word that you've given us, Lord. The truth of your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessing that it is to have your spirit in us to lead us into all truth. And Lord, I do pray for those who just need to be fed more. I pray that you'll motivate people to pull the Bibles off their shelves and to delve into your word deeply, Lord. Help us to feed each other, Lord. Help us to be accountable to one another and help us to protect each other. And for that, Lord, we do thank you that Jesus is our shepherd, that he is our teacher and he is our king. 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.